call ourselves Auslabs. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is some work that we've been doing to put Kernel Virtual Machine on our IBM Power 8 servers. So I'll talk about the new IBM systems that we've released recently. Uh, then I'd like to tell you a bit about the Power 8 chip, the Power KVM hypervisor that we've developed, uh, how that's organised, the Opal firmware that it runs on top of, and then talk a little bit about some of the interesting aspects of making KVM work on the Power 8 processor. So this gives you a picture of the systems that IBM released in June last year, uh, all based on Power 8. These are the low-end one and two socket systems, and you'll see that some of them have this Linux logo on top of them, and they're systems that are priced more aggressively, uh, that only run Linux, not AIX or iOS, as in the i5 OS. And the other thing is that these systems uh, can be ordered with, with KVM on them instead of IBM's proprietary PowerVM hypervisor. So what's interesting here? Well, firstly, these have got the Power 8 processor, and I'll talk more about that in a while. Um, Stuart Smith is going to talk about, uh, in his talk, about some results he's got with uh, MySQL on Power 8, which shows that it really does perform really well. Uh, the really interesting thing, though, from, from my point of view, is that these are the first IBM Power systems ever that have an open source virtualization product on them, and that's Power KVM. So, as I said, you can order either Power VM or Power KVM on your Power 8 box if it's one of these Linux boxes, and that gives you a host Linux kernel that runs on the bare metal uh, with the KVM module, QMU, Libvirt, and a Kimchi, which is a GUI management thing, and that is all an IBM product that's fully supported by IBM. Secondly, these are the first IBM power systems since Power 4 where you can actually run Linux on the system without a hypervisor underneath the Linux kernel. Back in the Power 4 days, you could do that. Then in Power 5, we got PowerVM, and from then on, everything ran on PowerVM. But now, we don't have to have that anymore. That means that the host Linux kernel can access all of the system. It, there's, there's nothing, there isn't any more privileged mode than hypervisor mode. There isn't any system management mode that you can't get to. You can get to everything. Uh, all of this code is upstream now. If you look in Arch PowerPC Platforms PowerNV in the recent Linux kernels, you'll see all the code that's running in the kernel there. And furthermore, recent versions of Linux on power distributions uh, will run in this mode on the bare metal. Now, there is a layer of firmware there we call Opal, uh, which Jeremy's going to talk about tomorrow, I believe. And this is also open source. Uh, I'll talk about it more later. And all of this, really, the development has been led by our group in Canberra, uh, based in Canberra. Some of us are in Adelaide or Sydney or wherever, uh, but it's been developed locally. OK, now about Power 8. This is just a slide that's got some uh, stats about the chip. The chip, there's actually two versions of the chip. One has six cores, the other has 12 cores. Uh, they run SMT8, that means eight threads per core. Uh, you can run one, two, four, or eight threads per core. Uh, so you can have up to a 96-way SMP on one chip. Um, eight dispatch, 10 issue, 16 execution units so that in each cycle you can do dispatch eight instructions, issue 10, and execute, do a step of execution of 16 instructions. The internal data flows are generally twice as, as fast as Power 7. Uh, it's got better prefetching, and then it's got um, data and, and instruction cache per core, then a 512K level two cache per core, and then a shared 96 megabyte level three cache on chip. Um, one of the interesting things there that it, it is new in the instruction set architecture is the transactional memory facilities. I'm not going to talk much about that, but what it basically enables you to do is to do a bunch of 
memory loads and stores and other operations and have them appear to the rest of the system as a single indivisible atomic operation. So you can do in a single operation, apparently a single operation from the point of view of the rest of the system, you could, for instance, take an, uh, take an item out of one doubly linked list and link it into another doubly linked list or something like that. From the point of view of KVM, the interesting things are firstly that we have now eight threads per core rather than four in power seven. The core automatically switches between the single threaded two-way, four-way and eight-way mode according to which threads are actually active and there's an automatic rebalancing of threads between thread sets. The thread sets are in the higher SMT modes, the core actually gets divided uh, physically into, like the execution units will be divided into two sets and then the system can then also rebalance threads so it can move a thread from one core, one half of the core to the other half of the core in order to maximise the use of the core. However, we still have the constraint that all of the threads share a single MMU context and therefore have to be in the same partition. By partition, I mean either a KVM guest or the KVM host when it's running with the MMU turned on. We can have hypervisor code that runs with, in real mode with the MMU turned off, and in real mode it doesn't matter uh, what the MMU context is. Now, one thing they added in Power8 is the ability to split the core into four subcores, each with two threads. So we still have eight threads, but they're divided into four groups of two, and each subcore has a separate MMU context. So now we can actually run four partitions, four guests, or you know, two running the kernel and two running guests, or something like that. We can run four different things on these same core, on the on the one core. However, when we do this, the core is permanently in SMT8 mode, so we lose some of the benefits of switching to single-threaded when, when things are idle. Uh, and in particular, the way it works is that, as far as instruction dispatch goes, each subcore gets a quarter of the cycle, so it's just a strict round-robin between the four subcores. Uh, the reason they did that was to make the performance more predictable. It reduces the impact that one subcore can have on another. Now, in Power KVM, the way we deal with this is that we currently have a single SysFS control that controls whether all of the cores are in uh, whole core mode or in four-way split core mode. So you just have you just make that choice. You know, essentially, it boot up, and then you run it that way. Something else they added was a fast mechanism for one thread to send an interrupt to other threads. Uh, this is a new message send instruction, and when you send a message from one thread to another and it arrives on the second thread, uh, it takes an interrupt using a new interrupt vector. So there's the intracore version available to supervisor mode code, so the operating system can use this uh, running as a guest, um, but that only works within a core, in hypervisor mode, you can actually use it across between two different cores. The reason for that restriction is that uh, when you're running as a guest, the addressing becomes difficult. When you're running as the hypervisor, as the host, uh, you know the numbers because you're not moving around. In other words, a core, a virtual core is not being dispatched. Because you're running on physical cores, you know the numbers. If you're running as a guest, you're running on a virtual core and that virtual core can move around from one physical core to another. So the addressing for the hardware gets difficult. That's why they didn't allow the inter-core version for, the uh, for supervisor mode code. Now, this is good. It's nice and fast. It's quicker than using the interrupt controller to do an IPI. However, <laughs> they didn't virtualize the thread numbers. So this actually puts some constraints on how we schedule virtual, virtual CPUs onto threads in a physical core, uh, because what it means is that virtual thread three out of a virtual core has to go onto physical thread three in the core, the physical core that we put that virtual core on. So that's a constraint we have to deal with. Another thing they added, micro partition prefetch. This is actually quite a cool thing. What it is is that the hypervisor can poke the hardware to say, 
please look in the level two cache or the level three cache and write into memory the physical addresses of all of the cache lines that are valid in the cache. So the hardware goes off and does this in the background without the CPU having to do anything more. And then, so you do that when you're switching away from a guest back to another guest or to the host or something. So that you record what cache lines that guest actually had in cache that it was using. Then when you go to schedule that guest again, either on the same core or perhaps on a different core, you can poke the hardware again and say, go to this place in memory and find addresses where you can and, and prefetch those, those cache lines into memory. So you can get the cache back into more or less the same state it was uh, when you previously were running that guest. And we implemented this and we found that basically in no cases does it slow things down and in most cases it gives us like 10 to 20% performance improvement. So that's basically turned on all the time now. Finally, there's transactional memory. Uh, I explained that a little bit before. Um, the main thing that we have to worry about here from the point of view of KVM is the extra state because we now have both the current transactional values of registers and the checkpointed state. This is how, as part of the way it works, it actually uses these two copies of the registers. So this is extra state that we have to save and restore. Okay, then moving on to the Power KVM hypervisor product. What this is, is basically, it's an operating system. Essentially, it's a Linux distribution, a very small cut down one. Uh, you can order that on an IBM Power 8 system if it's one of those Linux only systems. Uh, you can say, please pre-install that and your system will come with that already installed. On top of that, you can then create guest virtual machines and in them you can run any of these Linux on Power operating systems. Uh, basically, any version of Linux on Power that supports Power 7 or Power 8 will run as a guest. RHEL, SLES, Ubuntu, Fedora. This hypervisor is all completely open source, based on Fedora 19. Uh, there's a 310.53 kernel, uh, QMU 2.0, libvirt 1.25. The local modifications um, are basically just fixing bugs, adding features, but that's all available, it's all out there, you can get the source. And finally, Kimchi, which is a fairly recent thing. It's an open source project to develop a web-based web GUI for managing small numbers of virtual machines on, on a single system. It's a completely open system. You can SSH as root into the system, you can install packages, you can change the configuration, uh, essentially you can do anything you like. You can install things like cloud management agents, you can install OpenStack or the overt VDSM daemon, uh, or if you like you can even completely replace, replace it with Ubuntu or something. We don't mind, just that you know, if you've made substantial modifications it may be difficult to support, to get support, that's all. We've done extensive testing. Sometimes it feels like uh, 2014 was entirely occupied with fixing bugs that the test team found. <laughs> it wasn't quite like that, but it felt like it sometimes. Um, each version by IBM policy is supported for three years from the initial release. Uh, the releases, you can see there, the first one was on the 10th of June, so that starts the three-year clock. Uh, we've had various service packs and additional releases since then and there'll be a, a new version later this year. For management, you can SSH in and use Versh, so you can say, you know, Versh define, uh, Versh console, or Versh start, Versh stop, all of those things that you would do with Versh on x86, they basically work here as well. Or you can use the kimchi GUI. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute that lets you just click a button to say, you know, create me an instance. You've got buttons to say how big you want that instance to be and then it pops up and then you can have the console in a window inside your web browser. Or you can install OpenStack agents or Overt or pretty much anything you like uh, and manage it with one of those higher level systems.
So it's all really very similar to the way an x86 KVM system would work. Um, there are obviously some differences inside the guest because it's a Linux on power guest, not a Linux on x86 guest. So for instance, you don't have DMI decode because we've never had DMI decode. We've got alternative mechanisms using the device tree to convey the same sort of information. So you continue to use those. There are some differences in virtual to CPU, physical CPU mappings, which I'll talk about later. Um, but on the whole, it's very familiar. Here's a picture of kimchi. Um, you can see here's a list of guests that are running. Well, some of them are running, some of them are shut down. Uh, a little tiny um, picture of what the console looks like on one of them. Um, nice graphical indications of the amount of CPU and memory and so forth that it's using. Disk I.O. And buttons to start and stop them, that sort of thing. So that's quite cute. Okay. Now, to, to how all of this is, is put together, if you're familiar with KVM, this is really a pretty familiar picture. We have a host Linux kernel with a KVM module in it. That KVM module lets us then run uh, guest operating systems inside a virtual machine, and each one has a QMU instance, and QMU does the usual thing. It provides the device model, the control interfaces, and basically the initialization and termination of the guest. Uh, the host can run other processes, other processes there, host OS process. The interesting things here are, of course, that we have the Opal firmware. Um, and I've shown that in the way I have because it's not a layer that separates you from the hardware. It's, it's a lump of code that provides useful facilities, sort of a little bit to the side. And the FSP, which is the service processor, uh, that's the thing that we have on current power machines, which is a little microprocessor, um, actually has an Ethernet interface and exports a web interface. Uh, it does things like power control, reboot, um, serial console for the host, uh, non-volatile memory, those sorts of things. It also does a certain amount of, uh, of error checking of the system, error checking and reporting. Um, it, it's continually scanning the various fault registers in the system to see if anything's gone wrong, that kind of thing. So with, with the guests, the guests are all power virtualized. Uh, this is a very familiar story if you're from a power VM world because in, with power VM, Everything is power virtualized. And indeed, the hardware architecture is actually set up, uh, designed for guests being power virtualized rather than full, virtu full virtualization. So we use the same interface as PowerVM. It's defined in a document called PAPA Plus. That's Power Architecture Platform Requirements. Uh, that means that all of the existing distribution kernels from Red Hat, SUSE, whoever, Ubuntu, they all continue to work under Power KVM, and they work basically the same way that they do under Power VM. So this gives us a nice, easy path. It means that we don't have to ask the distributions to produce a separate version for, for KVM from the version from, that they already do for Power VM. It's the same thing. The guests for I.O., there's basically three options, one more than with Power VM. You can do virtual I.O., you can have virtual disk network console basically implemented with para virtualized interfaces. Uh, you can use the interfaces defined in PAPA, or you can use the Linux VertIO interfaces. Uh, PowerVM doesn't support the Linux VertIO interfaces, but it turns out that things like RHEL 6 included the VertIO drivers, VertIO block, VertIO net, and they were never ever tested. However, we got lucky. Vertio block and Vertio net in RHEL 6 worked just fine. So, so that was really good. However, the Vertio balloon in RHEL 6, if you use that, it's completely buggy and it will crash the guest. Still, that's what it is. With these virtual I.O. options, the I.O. serving is done in QMU or the kernel, same as x86. On PowerVM, you need a separate partition called the Virtual I.O. Server, VIOS, uh, 
uh, you don't need a separate partition here. Second option for I.O. is PCI pass-through, otherwise known as device assignment. With this, you have a PCI device in your system and you say, this guest is allowed to access this PCI device directly, and then you have a driver in the guest and it talks to that device and does I.O., and that's, that's fine. The third option is device emulation. This is pretty common on x86, but PowerVM doesn't do it. Uh, what it is is that there is a device which the guest accesses as though it's a real physical device, but it's not. What happens is that every time the guest tries to uh, you know, do an I.O. operation to the device, it traps to the hypervisor and the device is emulated. So for a uh, USB host controller, for instance, all of the accesses to the device registers get trapped and emulated in QEMU. Uh, so this is a lower bandwidth operation uh, op option. Um, it's the sort of thing that you can use for a USB keyboard and mouse quite successfully, but you wouldn't really want to use it for a high bandwidth network adapter, for instance. The PowerKVM host kernel relies on Opal firmware. Um, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, this, is, this comes as standard on these uh, Linux-only machines. And finally, one point that I probably don't need to make here, but with other audiences, I sometimes get the question, oh, cool, you've got KVM. Can I run Windows on that? No, you can't. Sorry. <laughs> it's still a power machine. It doesn't run x86 code natively. It doesn't run x86 operating systems natively. You can do full emulation. That's fine. It's slow, but... No, you can't run Windows. I'll get on to Indian in a minute. Um, currently, this is a big Indian host, but the next version is going to be Little Indian. Yeah. Linux on Power is actually moving quite quickly towards being Little Indian. I suppose. No. Okay. The Opal firmware, uh, this is actually what Ben Herrenschmidt's mostly been doing for the last couple of years. Uh, it's partly why he handed over some of the maintainership to Michael Ellerman. Uh, this is firmware which is uh, stored in flash memory on the FSP and loaded by the FSP onto the Power 8 system in order to, to boot it. Um, it's all open source, uh, hosted at that GitHub location. Jeremy's going to talk more about it tomorrow. But there are three, really three main components. Um, I guess Ben must have been skiing in France or something before he started to design this. But we've got Ski Boot that starts up the machine, does various initialization tasks, creates a device tree, and it, then what it does is it starts a Linux kernel. This Linux kernel then has a root file system which is Ski Root, and that includes the Petty Boot bootloader. The petty boot goes around and it looks at all of the disks and so forth and says, what can I find that looks like a grub configuration file or a yaboot configuration file? And it parses all of those and it gives you a menu of things that you could possibly boot. And it has a default and a timeout, of course. It then loads that kernel and init ramfs from wherever, could be disk, network, whatever, and transfers control to that new kernel via kexec. So then you have your host kernel running. There is a piece called Ski Run that contains some runtime services, and these are mostly actually interfaces to the FSP. Now, it's not that we're trying to hide anything here or stop you from doing anything. It's just that these are all uh, these runtime services uh, are all things that are sort of low-level housekeeping things that you need a system to do, but you don't particularly want to have to worry about the details of them. So you can call Opal to do these things, serial console, real-time clock, etc. Okay. There's my time. Actually, are there any questions up to this point? That's an interesting question. I mean, there's no particular technical reason why it shouldn't. Um, we'll have to see. I mean, my group is not working on that. 
um, if someone was interested to do the necessary work, it, it would be perfectly feasible. Okay, so where were the interesting things in actually porting KVM to run on Power8? Now, obviously, there's a certain amount of stuff that is basically just you've got a list of architected state and you've got some special purpose registers and they have to have a different value for the guest compared to the host, so you've got to do some context switching. That's all relatively straightforward. The thing that did actually cause us to have to do some thinking was this constraint where all of the hardware threads of a core have to be in the same partition. Uh, or if you're using split core mode, all of the threads of a subcore have to be in the same partition. Now, partition, as I said, it corresponds to an MMU context uh, for an operating system instance. I say for an operating system instance because it's a little different from x86, where you essentially have an MMU context per process. With the power MMU, there's actually a, a two-step translation where one step is managed by the operating system and the second step is managed by the hypervisor, and it's sort of like a it's sort of like a real to a, a, a guest real to host real translation, a guest physical to host physical translation. It's not exactly that, but that's near enough. So we have this we have this uh, context, and we have to make sure that we don't have thread zero trying to run with one MMU context and thread one trying to run with a different MMU context because it doesn't have a different MMU context. And if it thinks it does and tries to go to kernel addresses in that context, they're actually translated differently and all hell breaks loose and the whole thing explodes. <laughs> so our current solution for this is to run the host in single-threaded mode. In other words, we only have one thread on each core or one thread on each subcore active in the host. All of the other threads are, are offline and they're in a power saving mode called NAP mode. So in whole core mode, you'll see CPU 0, 8, 16, 24 online, 1 to 7, 9 to 15 and so forth will be offline. Now this means, of course, that from the host point of view, there's nothing running on them. The scheduler will not run any tasks on them. Uh, from the host point of view, they're doing nothing. However, we can send them an IPI to wake them up out of NAP mode and into processor interrupt and say, here, go and run this guest virtual CPU. Now, what this means is that we don't have the situation where uh, one thread wants to run in the kernel, the host, the host kernel, and another thread wants to run in a guest. Because there is only one thread, you know, if it wants to enter the guest, it can. However, we do want the guests to be able to run multi-threaded in SMT8 mode or SMT4 or whatever. So then what we do is we say that one vCPU task, when I say a vCPU task, I mean the software task in the host operating system of which there is QMU creates one of these tasks for every virtual CPU. So one of those takes responsibility for all, all eight vCPUs in that virtual core. We call that the runner task. So that's typically the first one that comes along and wants to enter the guest. So it comes along, it's running on a host CPU, it says, I'd like to enter the guest now, and it can just enter the guest. And then another one comes along and wants to run, uh, it'll be on a different host CPU, it can send an IPI to the uh, physical thread and say, please wake up and run this vCPU. So that way we can actually get multiple vCPUs running on one core. Then what will happen is at some point uh, these vCPUs will do something that needs service from the host. Perhaps they will uh, take a hypervisor page fault. They'll attempt to access memory that the hypervisor has paged out from underneath them. Or they will do a hypercall. When that happens, all of those threads have to come back to the host and then the, the thread, the vCPU task, takes over the job of handling that, uh, that operation. So to manage all of this, we introduce the notion of a virtual core. 
what this is is that we say that uh, you've got a guest that wants to run in SMT8 mode, 8 way threaded mode, and so what we'll say is that vi virtual CPUs 0 to 7, they constitute virtual core 0. 8 to 15, that's virtual core 1, and so forth. And then we schedule virtual cores. That's what it amounts to. Now what's happening here is that we're keeping those virtual CPUs together. So virtual CPUs 0 to 7 will always run together. You'll never find that virtual CPU 1 is running on one physical core and virtual CPU 3 is running on a different physical core. Now what that means is that uh, the guest can actually make sensible SMT-aware scheduling decisions. In other words, it can say, I know that these two tasks are using the same cache stuff. I think I'd better put them on the same uh, core. And you can do that in the, inside the guest. It can put them on the same virtual core, and then they will actually be on the same physical core. Um, it also means that, for instance, if you want to put things on two separate cores, and the scheduler does that, like, say, the scheduler says, OK, I've put this task on CPU 0. Let's put the next runnable thing on CPU 8 so it's on a different core. They will actually be on different cores. You won't actually find them on the same core. So it, it, it means that the guest actually has control over whether things are scheduled together or apart as, as far as the cores are concerned. Now, the disadvantage is that the virtual SMT mode um, defaults to one. In other words, if you don't say that you want eight threads per core, you'll get one thread per core. And then what will happen is that you will only get one thread per physical core. Uh, unlike on x86, where a virtual CPU can be running on a core with any other process or any other virtual CPU, either from that virtual machine or a different virtual machine, uh, we can't do that. We don't do that. And so what will happen is that you will use up the machine very quickly. If you have, say, a machine with 20 cores, 160 threads, and you say, good, let's make a machine with 128 vCPUs, but you don't say SMT8, you don't say threads equals 8, uh, then you, know, you will have oversubscribed the machine by a factor of 6 without that really being what you intended. So what we're thinking is that perhaps one way to alleviate this situation is to allow the administrator to, to, to essentially say that uh, even if they say they want one thread per core or two threads per core, I want you to pack the machine with eight threads per core and to make the KVM then uh, give effect to that so that uh, that way we can, we can you know, pack these 128 virtual CPUs that you asked for, we can pack that onto 16 of the cores and that will run much more happily because we're not oversubscribing the machine. So this is something that we're just working on now. Uh, I think it will actually work out quite well. We will probably then have to be able to do these dynamic transitions between split core mode and, and whole core mode, uh, but I think we can manage that. Okay, so the future work that, you know, things we're working on at the moment, uh, firstly, this explicit control of the physical SMT mode for the guests. Um, secondly, to look at the places where we're still a bit different from x86 and see can we actually make it more like an x86 system. Uh, we haven't implemented SPICE at this point. That does appear to be something that's useful for OpenStack. We haven't done CPU and memory hot plug, um, partly because the interfaces there are necessarily a bit different from x86. With x86, that's done through ACPI. Uh, with power, that'd be done through power virtualized interfaces defined by PAPA, and we need to implement that. Next, the host in the next version is going to be Little Endian. Um, we already have basically KVM working with the Little Endian host. Um, Ubuntu and I think OpenSUSE uh, already a little Indian and support guests. Uh, we'll look at improving performance. The PowerH chip, one of the things I didn't mention is that it has on it 
uh, a set of accelerators uh, off core but on chip accelerators for things like um, compression and crypto and stuff and we'll look at supporting those and finally some good way to manage numer affinity uh, this this is a problem on x86 as well as power but um, the thing is that what you would like to be able to do is say make me a, make me a guest and tell it about the numer affinity in such a way that the virtual numer affinity that it's working with actually corresponds exactly to the physical numer affinity in other words we can fairly easily make a guest and say you've got two nodes and you've got you know 50 gigabytes of memory in each node and you've got these cpus in this node and these cpus in that node but all of that is virtual unless we do something to actually bind those cpus to physical cpus and that memory to physical memory in such a way that what we're telling the guest is actually real and corresponds to reality uh, and that can be done but it's a manual process and it's quite complicated and, and involved uh, and it would be nice to be able to do that automatically so are there any questions Is the deeply unnatural byte order to work with things like GPUs, is it? The little Indianness? Sorry? Is the uh, little Indianness to work with things like GPUs? Working with thing like, things like GPUs is certainly uh, one big motivation. Yeah. Uh, and then the other, of course, is that there are customers who have large amounts of software that they've written data on disk, uh, network communication with other machines all of which is just designed for x86 and takes no account of Indianness and to find and fix all of the Indian assumptions in their large amount of code is a daunting prospect and if they can just run little Indian then that's a whole class of problems that just vanishes. Because your data is, might be, end up similar to x86, would that be true? The data in memory, so you, it could be feasible to actually emulate uh, Little Indian certainly also software. makes it easier to emulate x86. Yeah. Yeah. True. Like yes. the i series is emulating a virtual machine in effect. Right. And then but I don't think we'd want to make x86 emulation the primary mode of operation yeah. because yeah. it would be slow. Yeah. But to cache what you've um, translated, I presume. Sorry? Cache? So you'd, you'd be yeah, yeah, you, you, the th there, there, are, there are procedures to do yeah. that. Thank you. Uh, Paul, what's your virtualization overhead? How much extra does it cost to have a virtualized Linux rather than the one running native? How long is a piece of string? Um, if you're CPU bound, it's very, very small. Uh, we've had some internal benchmarking done that showed that for CPU bound things, we're on a power or even slightly faster than power VM um, and you know, very close to bare metal. I think it's like a fraction of a percent or something. Uh, if, if you're doing I.O., then it you know, can be a different story depending on how much I.O. you're doing, what sort of I.O., whether it's emulated or virtual. Um, yeah. Uh, hi. Just reading a couple of uh, press release or papers here about the accelerators, the, the NVIDIA CUDA. How do they compare the performance? It says here that it's a need for high-performance accelerators for the cloud for the uh, Super Power 8, and that compares the, the KVM with, with others. And then I see a, another press release from IBM that now actually you are working with NVIDIA for a world architecture for Power 9. So mm -hmm. the question is, uh, is this only driven by HPC in the cloud, or there is other um, drivers that make these things happen? Well, why are you doing this? Why are we doing Power KVM? Uh, with CUDA, with, Sorry, with NVIDIA. Um, where is this? He'd say. So, uh, the why, why, are we, why are we working with Nvidia? Yes. Well, why are we working with Nvidia? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at two distinguished engineers here from IBM, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that will end being pushing CUDA to be open source, perhaps. Um, 
Anton, I mean, can you answer free, that? <laughs> The short answer is yes, HPC, and, and, and if you're looking at that press release, probably the Coral supercomputer that we'll be building in a couple of years probably came up. So HPC is a huge driver of it, but um, what we're seeing across, say, our, our software group portfolio is more and more of those applications want to do significant amounts of, of computational things and, and, and things like NVIDIA are a way to achieve that. So, so it's, it's not just HPC. Mm. There's, there's a big push on analytics in IBM, and I guess that that's part of the, the thing. Uh, the, the, the NVIDIA stuff is sort of slightly orthogonal to the KVM work that I've been doing, uh, because you know either you just run bare metal and access the NVIDIA chip directly, or you use PCI pass-through to make the NVIDIA chip appear in a guest, and then you drive it from the guest. And so from the KVM point of view, the thing to do is to make the PCI pass-through work, and then from our point of view, our job is done. And then it's up to somebody else to write the, the drivers or whatever to, to drive the NVIDIA chip. Um, with the runtime services, is that only something that's exposed on... Uh, Sorry? The ho with the runtime services, are yes. they only for the host? They're not, for, they're not exposed to the guests? And Correct. Is, and they're not running like on a separate controller. They're, they're still like executing on the actual CP on the Power 8? Yes. Yes, it's, it's a lump of code in memory that is just somewhere up, you know, high in memory, and then the device tree tells us where it is, and then we just call it for various services. So, so the host kernel call just calls into that code for various services? Yes. Okay. I mean, in fact, there is nothing to stop the host kernel just from implementing all of these things itself. It's a utility library, yes. Is there any chance of us getting some hardware donated to our university to play with? We've never been able to play with any Power 8 stuff or any Power PC stuff. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Who do I speak to? Um, Paul McKinney, perhaps? That question's a little above my pay grade is the problem. Sorry? So there's a number of answers. Uh, if, you're, if you're a community member, uh, we have machines set up at various universities. Uh, the first one is Oregon State University Open Source Lab. And uh, they've got a web page. You can apply for an account. And, you know, uh, and for, that's great for like porting and things like that. So it gives you access to a Power 8, gives you the uh, facilities. Uh, they've got it set up with uh, OpenStack so you can create and remove images if you depending on what kind of access you you get right um, if you're of course if you for if you want a machine of your own um, I'm sure that IBM sales would be happy to get a call from you <laughs> uh, but there's also some uh, development boards and I think I need to hand off to so this is Abby so if you can uh, talk to me offline I I'm sort of the manager of the Oslabs team I can work with, we are actually having a plan to have some open power systems seated to the community. Um, so as part of the, the conference, you know, Paul, me, and Anton, and some of the other guys are willing to sort of work on how many do we need and then work out a plan to, to send them out. So. Uh, there's also um, a full system simulator that IBM has, so you can download it now and you can be running on a virtual Power 8 on your laptop in search for Stuart Smith's blog. And he's got a great instructions on how to get going on that. Yep, so that'll run Ski Boot, it'll run Linux, full Linux boot to user space, all that stuff. Um, and it'll boot up in a few seconds on your laptop. Um, and we're working on Quimu to do the same thing too. So, um. We're out of time. Do, do we want to mention the tie-in board? Can't, is, right, but I mean... Joe Public can go and order that board, can't they? From Tayan? And do we know a price? Sorry? No longer available? <laughs> okay. Uh, we have a small gift from the team. Great, thanks. <laughs>